We've been hoping and praying that one of these days, another multi side would finally get their act together and start giving us a bit of help in Europe. And this is the year that one of them has very much done that. But in doing so, they've actually achieved something that I don't believe even happened in the latter stages of the MTK save last year. So let's talk about it. We're feeling much better than this time last season, and that means we deserve a little treat. And that is exactly what we're engaging in over on stream right now with a little bit of Wonder Kid shopping. So join us over there after you've caught up over here. The VODs, of course, are on the second channel, linked in the description. You know the situation. So we came into season 12 of Building a Nation with Sirens of Malta off the back of pretty much a down year. We'd basically become entirely mediocre overnight. And one of our biggest goals this year was to figure out why was it just a blip? Did we have to make some changes to get ourselves back on the right footing? We also had in the back of our mind whether we could finally get that help from another multi side to make that push into the top 15 and get that coveted fifth team in Europe. So transfers and the last few years we've been increasing our transfer spending pretty much year on year this year we've actually taken a step back slightly not by a huge amount but it's not been the same level of spending that we've been used to over the last years mostly to try to restock the loan farmers we've been really successful with that more on that a little bit later but we have in amongst all of this absolutely shattered our record transfer spend on a single player so we'll talk about him in a minute but before that there is one notable out which we need to discuss first and that is the departure of Sasha Rangelovic for six and a half million pounds to Al Fata. now the situation with Rangelovic was you can see frankly he's a very good footballer he played pretty well for us over the sort of two I think it was two and a half seasons that he actually played for the club but he was nothing but trouble the entire time a strong wind blowing in off the coast was enough for this guy to get unsettled and want to leave the club and it was pretty much the only player that every single wind would just constantly push for a move and complain. He'd been nothing but trouble pretty much the entire time. But over the course of the summer, we didn't take those first bids that came in. We upset him. We let the bids keep coming in, kept rejecting them. And as a result, the bids kept going up and up and up. And towards the end of the window, six and a half million pounds was agreed. And I think that's a pretty decent out. Considering the values of our players, the only way we can really make any decent money on them is by getting them, bid them up, then reject them, bid them up, reject them through the entire transfer window, and then hope that someone comes in with a really big offer at the very end of it. And that was essentially what we did with Sasha to get some decent cash and that was some much needed money honestly but that's enough of that now to the ins because there's a player in here i'm going to show you him at the end because he hasn't actually joined us yet he will join this summer but i have to say he might be the biggest bargain that we buy in this entire save i'm very excited if he's as good as i think he could be but the first in was ethan olate who came in from junior for five hundred and seventy-five thousand pounds and these are the kind of guys that we've really been focusing on this year with regards to the loan farm the sort of players who look like they might have decent potential although our scout that was scout in Colombia genuinely is appalling and we're slowly but surely phasing out all of his assignments so we can get rid of him without him taking all his paperwork with him but these sort of players that are around the half a million pound mark that we can afford that the wages aren't too bad and it means we can get them into the loan farm relatively fast as you'll see that he has gone on loan to Sweetie this year like he's a decent footballer he just maybe doesn't have the potential ceiling to ever play for us these are the exact type of players that I target for loan farm signings they don't cost too much money they're not too high on wages you can tie them down to relatively long deals relatively cheaply and you can just keep them there forever and and he can even head a football, although at times this year we found out that being able to head a football doesn't actually really matter that much. Yeah, I have no idea what Kadri's doing in that clip. He's about five yards away from the ball, but sure, you at least made it look like you're trying to go for it. But next was a player for the actual first team, Wilson Ortiz, who joined us from Olympia for £975,000. Now, you may note that the thing below the season stats page for him is actually blurred at the moment. Now, the reason for this is because people have said that when I sign players for the first team, they can see when they've played in the Champions League and thus it can kind of give away potential progression for us. If you can see how many games they've played, it might indicate how far we went. So for any player that's been in the first team, I will try my best to blur that box out for the time being. Uh, I will tell you any kind of like league stats and stuff if I can do it, or at least just blur the Champions League part for you, I suppose, right? I'm doing my best. I don't want you to have spoilers. But we love some central midfielders. So Wilson Ortiz was perfectly on that bill. The fact is he was way too good for the loan farm. That two and a half star CA pretty much eliminates him from being a loan farmer right now. Um, most of the time it feels like two star is about the most we can get out. We have got one two and a half star guy out on loan. In fact, two now, I think. But that's from development while they're on loan. But I really like him. Four goals and seven assists in the league for us this season as well. He did score a goal in the Champions League for us too. He's actually wanted by someone, which is intriguing. Who's that? Pierre, okay. 
That's usually a good sign. Wanted by Paris Saint-Germain is normally a very, very good sign about that. In fact, we've actually used that as a scouting tool lately. Next, a very intriguing one, and I believe that this is a proper good one for us. This is Ever Espino. He's joined us on loan this season. Um, there's a reason for that. From Nationale over in Uruguay. And you can see that from the fact that it's blurred out that he's played a lot of games for us this season in various competitions. Not that much actually in the league, but he is a centre-back. Uh, has made a few high-profile mistakes here and there, but I really do like him. And the fact is, he's even considered a wonder kid by the game, which is less meaningful than it used to be, but still very awesome. Now, we had him on loan this season. We paid around about a million pounds for the loan. The main reason for this was that he wouldn't actually talk to us at the time, but we figured if we get him for a year, ingratiate him, we've got an optional fee, we'll see if we can pay it. You can see from the fact that it says join permanently that we will be signing him at the end of this season for £7 million. Pounds. It's quite a lot, but I really, really like this guy. And I feel like, with, you know, six foot five, he's got a reasonable bit of speed. The only thing about him that I really don't like is he's got quite low aggression, and I would like it to be a little bit higher. But needless to say, I still think he's fantastic. Next, we drop £2.7 million pounds on Evtim Krastev of Levski Sofia because we were always looking for a little bit more depth in those wide areas particularly to with Vida you know he's still a fantastic player he's still our starting right wing back but at some point someone is going to overtake him we're just not entirely sure who that is right now but he does always still put up the numbers so we figured we'd add another one to the mix in the form of Krastev. I've just been looking through the transfers here and I've noticed how few like proper quality players we've actually brought in in this window it's mostly been over the course of this year because i was so happy with the first team squad lots of guys for like the loan farm fodder most of which aren't worth showing honestly but we were able to do a couple of flips where we brought a player in we're trying to get them loaned out but then we actually got a transfer bid offered for them and this was richmond asare we paid very little money for him brought him in on a free transfer and then got him off to goodyear and yeah he hasn't really played that much for them this year honestly um but these are the kind of signings i don't mind doing because they come in they go out they'll at least be a player that Goodyear could maybe sell or they'll develop. And that's what we're trying to do with this kind of thing. But now to the record-breaking guy. And this is he. This is Alejandro Cazola. We paid, I mean, technically it's 9 million. Uh, it's in installments as well, but it could potentially rise to 12.25. And I think we've overpaid personally, but we really did like the look of this lad. And to be able to sign a guy off of a team like Basel was a little bit... The fact is, he had two Swiss caps already at the age of 18. And we figured that there must be something to him at that point. And he's played reasonably well for us this season. Hasn't been a complete starter or anything like that. He's very much one for the future. And I think, yes, it is emphatically an overpayment. Obviously, his value is minuscule because the fact is, anytime we sign a player who has high value, the moment they join us, their value is crap. And that is a real problem. But there's not really a lot we can do about it. And that's why we do have to be quite careful with high profile signings. You can see we are starting to spend a little bit more money, but we always have to have that in the back of our mind, especially when it comes to things like FFP, which we will talk about later. But I said I had one more little surprise, and that was basically the next gen list. We all use the next gen list as a bit of a shopping spree and just to find some players to scout. But the fact is, most of the time, they're not actually that good because all it means is they're playing a lot of football at a young age. And that could just mean that they're a little bit decent, have high CA, and are playing for a relatively low rep club. And it just means they get lots of football. That seems to be the reason but occasionally there are actually good players in it and i believe we found an absolute baller and this is he this is juan carlos perez um i don't really think i need to say much about his attributes for you to understand why we were so interested in this guy he is utterly unbelievable now he was number one or number two i believe on the next gen I think he was number one he was number two i believe on the next gen list he was wanted by paris saint germain but we have paid 1.8 million pounds for him 1.8 million pounds he is probably now he does have red injury prone or dark red that is definitely a concern admittedly but you can't really say no when a player of this kind of quality falls in your lap at 19 um now we don't know where the potential is actually going to be because our columbia scouts as i said earlier are all over the shop essentially our scout that had knowledge of columbia that does a lot of the team reports there um he's a guy from really early in the save and he has almost no ability but because he's doing all the team reports if you sack them you lose all the team reports and it doesn't get reassigned so slowly but surely over the course of a year i'm reassigning all of his tasks as they come in until we can finally get rid of him for someone better but ignoring potential stars for a second, it's impossible to argue that he's not an excellent footballer. And that's really all that matters to me. 18 acceleration, 17 pace, and that will probably still go up by maybe one more over the course of his career. Finishing is obscene. And frankly, his composure and his like mentals are actually very good as well. But the first thing we'll do is get those composure and things like that off the ball up even higher to make him the complete striker. I think probably he might already be our best striker when he joins us. And that is saying something. And it might allow us to make an enormous sale this summer, potentially to a Saudi side, just to keep the club afloat a little bit as well. But I'm very excited about him. And that has reminded me actually about one of the strangest stories that I cannot believe that I didn't mention in the last recap video, because it has actually now been permeating through the club for over a year. And that's because you lot are about to learn about the Roy Volution. This is Roy Fleming. Now, you'll note that he has no career stats and has never had a club before. And this is something that happens in FM 
occasionally. Now you'll note as well that he is Anguian. He has English second nationality, Anguian first nationality. You'll also note that he's extremely excellent. So we have recruitment focuses set up that we use and if you want to know more about those um, check out Iron Owl's channel as he has a whole video and that's the exact sort of setup that we're using. And basically they offer every age bracket below 18. So we have one that just finds 15 year olds with any kind of quality, 16, 17, 18 and one that does all of them but we've got it set so that they don't interfere with each other so you get different players in each report. Now the 15 one almost never finds any players because most players gen at 16 or older and also your scouts look a bit sus when they're just scouting for 15 year old players let's be honest but one day we got a guy in one of those reports called Roy Fleming. This is Roy. Now, at the time, he actually had five-star PA, and it kind of fluctuates because he's technically on trial here. More on that in a minute. But when you see a player who's that young, with that kind of potential, and reasonably good attributes, and has Angia as his nationality, you don't say no on a free transfer. Now, truthfully, we won't actually find out if he's any good or not until he actually joins us, which won't be until the 22nd of October. Now, the thing is, we actually signed him up two years ago. Uh, <laughs> he has been on trial at the club for nearly two years at this point, because obviously if you sign a free transfer and they're not allowed to join you yet because of age restrictions, they can come on trial permanently until such time as that happens. So he's been banging in goals for our youth team for the past two seasons. In fact, I believe he's been playing some games in the under-23s and scoring goals for our under-23 squad at the age of what the time was 16. And it's not hard to see why. Resolute personality, because he's on trial, we still don't know all of his attributes, but what we can see suggests that there is a hell of a player in here. And if he actually is as good as this, not not only for me would he be the greatest Anguian player of all time potentially, but it's just a wonderful story to have players gen like this. 100 caps for Anguia, absolutely certain on that one. So yes, welcome to the Roy Revolution. He will finally join us permanently after 27 months on trial in October, and hopefully I'll have some interesting things to report back about Roy next season. So stay tuned, because there's a story here, I can feel it. Right, that's enough about that. Weird story, I realise, but that's why we do these videos, isn't it? Uh, now, before we move on to the stuff that's happened in the league, I just wanted to highlight, you're going to see it on screen right now, this wonderful infographic that was made by Tuffers, because I know some of you have struggled with the Lone Farm stuff, and there's many reasons that account for that, and I often get asked, you know, what to do X and Y, and my first question is usually, what are you doing currently? So, Tuffers has prepared this brilliant cheat sheet, which I'm going to put in the description so you can download the image yourself. That way you can blow it up because it's like a massive image. And it will work you through some of the steps that you can maybe do to help with your loan farm situation because it definitely can be done, but it is definitely a lot harder this year as we found out. But it definitely can be done. And that's the most important thing. And this is the steps that we're currently undertaking. Now, we're actually going to talk about tactics a bit later in this video because there was a certain point in the season where we changed our tactics, not dramatically, but a decent amount. And I want to talk about that when we actually come to it. And we actually won the league by 12 points. Uh, goal difference much closer to our points tally. A relatively low points tally for us. Only 65 this year. Three defeats in there, a couple of draws. Obviously, we rest players for various European games. The 12-point gap was a lot smaller uh, going into the final few matches. Uh, Zabar only took two points from their last four games, which actually included a 6-0 defeat to us in there as well. At one point, Hammering were 10 points off of second, and if they hadn't have drawn on the final day, they would have actually stolen second place away from Zabar, which we really wanted to happen. Luckily, Hammering won the cup, which is actually the be for the best, because it means they'll be the Europa League contender this year. That gives them a better chance of dropping down, because right now, we still need our best foot forward but Zabar will be in Europe for the first time in a while and what a season they've had just out of nowhere Gudja thankfully do end up getting that fourth spot because they are still vastly stronger and over time them and Hammerin are still the second and third best teams by a comfortable margin it's just a bit of a weird season for us so we're still happy with the teams we've got in Europe as for the second tier Tarshin and Sleema well Tarshin especially absolutely waltz through this league without a problem Nashar again are a massive disappointment despite all their insane loans they can't do nothing and spare a thought for Shara down here uh, who are officially the worst team in the history of this league 29 defeats out of 30, what, three points, uh, their only defeat win actually came against Santa Lucia, minus 75, minus 75, they conceded 90 goals in 30 games, <laughs> which now brings us to us in Europe, and I need to change to an earlier version of the save so I can show you some of the earlier fixtures, because it has been weird this year, so if you cast your minds back, not from last season, but the season before, when we had that unbelievable breakout season, we were brilliant in Europe, got ourselves into the top eight for the first time, and the progression felt amazing, obviously Hammering were helping too, but we were looking good, like a team that was only on the up, and then last year, Pretty much the arse just fell out of us. And we were at a loss as to why. Because one of the things you always hear in FM is, oh, they're learning your tactics. As we all know, or we should know, that is not a thing in FM. Teams don't learn your tactics. They adjust to things based on other factors. One of those factors is reputation. Teams will set up slightly differently against you based on your reputation. So if, say, you join the Premier League as a newly promoted side, you're going to be lower rep than a lot of the teams. Generally speaking, they will come out and attack you. And it means that there are certain tactics that you can 
ploy that will in theory get you some good results doing that. And we believe that the huge rep bump that we would have got for finishing top eight in the Champions League, which definitely does help you with that, possibly means that certain teams in Europe and certain teams in general were now going to be taking us slightly more seriously and playing slightly different against us. And that sort of came to pass over the course of this year because it felt like we were just not able to create chances and just conceded way too much. So we did have to make some changes and you'll sort of see where we got to with that and why. I'll explain that when we get there. Particularly as we lost our first game in the Champions League this season in the second round qualifying against Ammonia, aside from Cyprus. We got a red card after 22 minutes. Obviously, we were still unlucky to lose based on the statistics of the game, but it was shocking. Luckily, away from home, it was no such trouble. 5 to 1 aggregate in the end, but it's annoying to drop some coefficient points in matches like that. But we did get through. That then led us to play Maribor of Slovenia, and obviously a fantastic result there away from home. Two for Fafana, Melman at an own goal in there, and Kamga and Lend back from his suspension. Got us through relatively easily to the next round, though we did have a cheeky little 1-0 victory in there as well. We still sort of struggled a little bit, but it wasn't looking too bad. But against lower opposition, it's hard to really tell. As we then face Ludogrets at home, but you can see again, it was a game where we really struggled to create much and conceded our opponent's only shot on target. Admittedly, it was from a penalty that was given for this. Uh, anyone going to close him down at all? Oh, that's fine. Just let him work. As if that's a penalty! But away from home, we were again much, much better in this one. Managed to get a 4-1 victory to progress through to the group stages, which is fairly straightforward. But it is a far cry from us absolutely clapping teams in these rounds, like we were doing maybe just two or three seasons ago, with a worse squad. Like, an emphatically worse team. But we were still feeling like, you know what, last season, it's a blip. We move on with this. Maybe this is just some bad results. We'll get into the Champions League and see what we're like against actually good sides. And to be honest, we got a relatively favourable set of teams this year in the Champions League. So there was a chance for some progress. As first up, things seem bright and easy against Villarreal, a 5-0 hammering. Now, what I would say is this is one of these 5 nils where I look at it and go, you know what? Yeah, great. Like, lots of shots, lots of shots on target. But I'm always concerned when you win a game like 5 nil and you're just not actually creating a huge amount. Like, we were definitely deserving of the victory. Hadn't even conceded a shot on target in this match. Defensively, unbelievably good and managed to take our chances in this game. But we weren't creating a massive amount of high-quality chances. We were just scoring some absolute bangers as it goes. But then we did translate that to a 2 nil victory over Ajax. But you can again see that the ability to create we were massively overperforming our XG at this point, essentially. We weren't actually creating that much. Still defensively stable as all hell. Only three shots on target against in two full matches is incredible. Barely any chances being given up. But the problem with that means that unless we can stop them from scoring, and you, you're just never going to be able to do that all the time, we weren't really looking good enough statistically to be able to continue this kind of form. And that very much came to a head in France against Lyon. Like, a decent Lyon side with Darwin Nunez up front, interestingly. Um, but you can see here, like... <sighs> They scored their only two shots on target, and this was the problem. We weren't creating enough to get ourselves out in front of games to prevent that from happening. Uh, it's always frustrating, and the fact is, the goalkeeper gets a bad rating, but these goals weren't his fault. There's nothing he could do about them. We just gave up a little opening, they scored the goal. It's frustrating when it happens, but we knew that there was something not quite sitting right with us, which then compounded in the next game as the exact same thing happened. Now, what I will say is Benfica are bloody excellent. They actually won the league phase this season, and they've won the Champions League in this save, so they're actually an extremely good side. So we played very, very well against them, but again, a frustrating straight in game where we played okay and then lost to their only two shots on target. It's, to happen in back-to-back -back games is utterly appalling. And the worry started to creep in at this point because it was the same kind of pattern, basically. We would not create a huge amount in games, although against Benfica, you'd expect to not be too there. But then we would give up little chances occasionally and they would almost always result in goals. It's pretty much a case that we were very strong defensively, but when we did concede a chance, it almost always seemed to result in a goal. And because we weren't creating enough attacking stuff, we could never really dig ourselves out of the holes. And never had that been more clear than this game away at Galatasaray. We went to our third consecutive defeat. Like, we'd looked good-ish against Villarreal and Ajax, but it felt like it was going to come to an end, and it just did. With three straight defeats here, uh, we were crap. Uh, maybe a little harsh to concede three goals, but we were just really, really bad uh, in this one. Created absolutely nothing, and that is a real problem, basically. Like, I feel like two years ago, we come here and win this very, very easily. So let's show you what we actually changed to hopefully bring us forward a little bit. So this was the system, obviously, that you'll already know that we were running up until that point. And it was great. It worked well for us. You already saw the results that we were getting with that before. But for whatever reason, things have changed. So what we've moved over to is this. It is a lot more aggressive, as you can see. And the logic behind what we're doing here is essentially this. We were very, very stable defensively for the most part in terms of like the sheer number of chances being given up it's just they were going in unfortunately and we weren't creating enough to balance that out on the other end so i decided to sacrifice some of that defensive stability to give us much more attacking threat essentially and that's what we've done we flipped the dm into an ao and made another trek out of that with the uh, strikers are set to stay wider so it allows us trek to make those run through the middle in addition we've also made a uh, ball winning midfielder out of the mez because that means they don't get in the way the ball winning midfielder on support i've never normally had much success with them but my goodness me he just racks up rating in that and i think it's because on the support role he's pressed 
missing a lot of the back line at times, all the midfielders, and he's constantly winning possession in that midfield, creates turnovers really quickly, and we get really nice counter-attacks out of it, and he almost always gets decent ratings, or at least reasonable ratings, better than he was when he was being carried back here. The rest of the tactic is actually fairly similar with like two more tweaks. One is that we're now focusing play through the middle, which I realize with wingbacks seems counterintuitive, but what I noticed is when we tried to force the play too wide a lot of the time, the the team would do it too quickly and it would just get intercepted by the opposition fullbacks. Whereas by focusing the play through the middle, you sort of hold the ball there, draw the other team narrow and then manage to unleash these passes and it just seems to work much better for us. The other change is that we noticed that we weren't shooting on target a lot anyway and we figured, screw it, let's just go really high tempo and try to absolutely just combust through teams and it does seem to work and we're particularly good in the first half with this type of thing we have to make earlier substitutions but the really high tempo does seem to unsettle teams as well as win loads of penalties the only thing i think that's left is for us to work on a more sustainable set piece uh setup for attacking corners that's an area that i feel like we've been under underscoring quite a lot and we do need to work on that but that's something for next season and that could really take us that extra step so that's what we're doing at the moment let's sort of show you how that then played out into matches first up it was a way to denmark and fc copenhagen now we'd literally only just put this tactic in at this point i think we played one game in the league with it so the tactical familiarity wasn't quite there but we still got the victory and you might say well it's fc copenhagen but creatively we looked a lot better uh, we overperformed our xg again but there was at least a decent amount of it in the first place still conceded a couple of goals but it is what it is and this is not a bad fck team by any means to give you an idea uh, Bayern munich ended up in the qualifiers for the champions league this year and they got knocked out in the third round of qualifiers by this fc copenhagen side and ended up in the europa league so they're no mugs so to go and get the away win there i was pretty pleased with that then we faced valencia at home and again it it was a frustrating one, but again, the, the actual performance was a lot better. The statistics, the underlying statistics is what I was really looking for from us, and we were looking a lot better. I'd honestly rather underperform XG sometimes than overperform, because I'd rather be creating the chances than not and getting lucky, and that was the main thing for me. Like, we scored in the 90th minute to, in theory, win this one, and then Richard Montagno got one back for them and equalised literally straight from the kickoff, which was frustrating, as this should have been a victory, but at least the stats were heading in the right direction. Especially in our final game, where we had one of the maddest games I've seen in ages, a five-all draw at Stamford Bridge against Chelsea. Uh, we went down a couple of goals early in this one, and I switched to the new tactic, basically, going, you know what, screw it, if we're going to go down, we're going to go down swinging. And boy, did we. Uh, we were actually winning this game until the 89th minute. We came from, I think... 4-2 down at one point in this one to lead 5-4 into the 90th minute but we couldn't quite hang on and frankly okay yes we won a couple of penalties but you got to win them right uh, we should have won this match we were the better side at Stamford Bridge away from home against Chelsea and that to me is an indication that despite the fact that we may have dropped those points against Valencia and technically against Chelsea we were heading in the right direction from a statistical standpoint and I think over the long term that's going to give us the results that we want in next season now in the end that actually ended up with us coming 18th with only uh, 11 points to show for it but still one better than last year and I feel like like had we played this system the entire way through we'd have definitely been a lot closer to sort of Chelsea in that ninth place the annoying thing is that win against Chelsea would have actually got us uh, into the top 16 and we'd have got a slightly better draw in the end we ended up drawing against Inter uh, 13th place Inter so a tough one but not so tough that we couldn't get the victory Eora Melman scored two goals to give us a two goal advantage inside 20 minutes we were cruising again creating good quality chances just a slightly lower quantity of the chances but we got the goals when we needed to get look at Eora Melman's 1.4 xg for him which unfortunately we just simply weren't good enough to get it over the line. Vida gave us the lead and gave us that 3-1 lead on aggregate as well. We thought if we could just hang on here, but it, it just wasn't to be, basically. Uh, we actually thought about shutting up shop a little bit, and the moment we made the change to go shut up shop, they actually scored before the tactic had even come into play, so we just kind of had to go for it at that point. But I think it shows that we are starting to compete again. Uh, this is arguably our best performance in the knockouts of the Champions League so far, and I think with a better start, we could definitely get us there. Uh, next year, I want to see us finally win our first knockout round, and I think it's definitely on the cards for us. Uh, Rich had another poor day, and this time, the goals were his fault. Two of the goals were definitely on the goalkeeper, but we can't entirely blame him. That being said, we are signing a new goalkeeper on a free this summer that might be able to alleviate that a little bit and potentially give us a little bit more strength although i do like richard i realize this might be a slightly longer video but i know you guys said you wanted to see more stuff so i'm trying to provide that but that was us out of europe again it's a shame but i feel like there's definitely some stuff there that gives me hope for next season if it, even if it is a couple of like weird years for us but that meant that we definitely needed some help from some maltese friends if we were to get to that 10 point mark for the year first up were birkikara and they had the unfortunate luck of getting drawn against swedish side efk yodbo in the second round of qualifying and were comfortably dumped out six nil on aggregate and that might might seem bad but let me just tell you this EFK got to the final of the conference league this year so hey Sveria, I guess but luckily we had Goodyear we had a lot more faith in them as they were able to get through against Panatolikos of Greece with a 2-1 kg victory on aggregate but that then set up a very very tough third round game against Trabzonspor of Turkey it's always Trabzonspor but they then pulled off a monster 3-1 victory in Turkey to take out the Turks four goals to two and progress to the playoff round where they would face off against Romanian club Dinamo Bucharesti and that was a game that we felt could go 
either way. Unfortunately, it went the way of the Romanians. Uh, a good one-all draw was then followed by a 3-0 defeat in Romania. A tough one. I think that 3-0 was kind of harsh. If I recall, it was a very even game. It was just one of those things that happens sometimes. So Gudjo once again fall at the final hurdle, but it does just feel like it's only a matter of time before they get big group. And I'm hoping next season is going to be their year because they just keep getting stronger. But that just left Hamrun to save the day in the Europa League. And boy, did they as they banged past Pogon in their first round of qualifiers 6-1 against the Polish side. It's a real good step up for them, which then set up a draw against Maccabi Tel Aviv. Unfortunately, tight 2-1 defeats both in the home and away games was enough to see them be knocked out at this stage, but at least it dropped them down into the third round of the Conference League, uh, where it was an absolute cakewalk for them as they absolutely annihilated Icelandic side KR 9-1 on aggregate in the third round. To give you an idea of where Hamrin are in terms of strength, they can regularly absolutely annihilate teams like this now, and that's good to see. And much like Goodyear, they would also face a Romanian side in the playoff, but this time a stronger one, I think, in the form of Cluj. But they did the business. 0-0 draw away from home, followed by a 3-1 victory at home, and Hamron did the business, getting to the group stage for the second time in three years. And that is a huge step in the right direction, and that is where the magic began. Yeah, um, you're seeing it. They, they, they won every game. They won every single game in the group stage of the Conference League. And this brings me to a point I need to make. Now, this could just be entirely apocryphal, confirmation bias, etc. But one thing I've noticed over the last couple of FMs is that it seems, just from watching the other teams from our nations in these, that the qualifiers are insanely tough, the knockouts are insanely tough, but the group stages, they always seem to get way more points than I would expect them to for some reason. It's very, very strange. But nevertheless, they got six victories out of six. They beat Dino Rebo Cresti, ironically, the, uh, they avenged Gurdjieff, they beat Dnipro, they put six past RFS, but this isn't the key thing. They beat Nantes away from home in France, and they beat Napoli at home. And obviously, there was a you know a win against Ferenc Farish in there as well. But yeah, we thought they had four potentially winnable games, and they did win all of them. But it's the fact that they managed to beat Nantes and Napoli in that spell as well, which is utterly wild. They only conceded one goal in their six games. I think they had the best defensive record of any team in the group stage. Unfortunately, they missed out on winning it due to Vittoria de Gumaraish's goal difference. But nevertheless, the only two teams to come on 18 points. I don't think a Hungarian side in the last save, even in like the latter stages of that save, ever got six wins out of six. They would always like get five wins or whatever, and then they would just drop off because they were already qualified. Hamron were having none of it, apparently and they managed to get second and therefore a bye to the round of 16, where they would get a very plum draw against 23rd place Aberdeen of Scotland. So then naturally they lost 3-1 in Scotland in a very tight game. It is what it is. This brings me back to what I was saying. It feels like that your they can play as well as they want in the group stage, but the moment they come to the knockouts, they could play the worst team in it and they would still just be comfortably beaten no matter what they do. Second leg was even worse in many ways. I'll actually show you the statistics for this game. It was a one-all draw. Hamron absolutely clapped them, but just couldn't do anything about it. Um, they were the better side over both legs and just went out. It's just how it is. Now, unfortunately, they were missing Salvucci, which definitely did have an impact as Conan missed some key opportunities in this game. But still, it's such a frustrating opportunity because they could have gone further, I think. They were definitely one of the best teams in this competition and should have done a lot better. But that's how it is. Because I mentioned that EFK got to the final of this. Yeah, they lost that final to Nantes of France, a team that Hamron beat away from home in the group stages, went on to win the damn competition. So there's definitely something here and it makes me think that in the future, Hamron are primed for knockouts of this competition pretty much every season if they were able to get into it. And getting into it's the hard part. But it's still good news. As you can see, 12 points on the year, our second best year ever. Now, I feel like if we'd had a better year ourselves, we'd have been on par. Because if you recall, Hamron did quite well once before, but we also had a good season that year. And that's the deficit, really, from 13.5 down to 12. But needless to say, it's still a five-point gain over last year, taking us to 46.8. And more importantly, that pushes us up into, I believe, anyway, yes, it does, pushes us up into 15th place. We go above Greece, who have had a relatively mid-season, in fact, not just mid, the appalling year. Luckily, that brings us right back into that battle. Nice with a seven-point gap now as well, meaning that we're unlikely to drop out of the top 15. And that is going to give us an extra team in Europe at the start of season 40. So we've got one more year of four teams, and I think we're at the strongest we've ever been. There's a great chance for us next year to get those two more teams, I would say, into the Conference League. And more importantly than that, we're losing a 4.1 year, which means if we could get those two teams in, I could see us getting 14 points next year and potentially jumping up, not 4.1, sorry, 4.7. Either way, I feel like we're capable of getting a 10-point gain or at least nine. There's every chance that we could be starting to rival teams like Belgium and that coming into next season. That is a really exciting bit 
bit of progress for us, but we do need to see it. Only one place of actual gain this year, despite the huge year, but the huge gap that we've put on everybody else. There really is moves being made now, and I'm really excited about it. Youth intake, sadly, nothing to report. Such is life, but we move. From a statistical standpoint this season, you can see that the amount of goals being scored is still not quite back to where it was, but that's because we've not really, we've been messing around with tactics and stuff in the second half of the season. But Henry Watara, right back into goal scoring this year. We started playing him a lot more, back to 31 goals. Uh, Fafana managed 14 this year, which is better than last year, but he's really he's one that i might consider if we get a really large bid in the summer moving on and replacing him with our other guy because after that breakout season he has just not been able to get at it at all uh and it's a bit of a shame but lots of goals coming from all over the team at least like to have six guys in double digits is decent but you can see how close a lot of them are to their xg no one's really been able to push beyond it and i'm hoping that we can start to see a bit more of that next year assist wise who else Vida, another 16 to add to his tally he is just unstoppable he may not look like the best player though when you actually see his profile which i'll show you in a minute but he just does it he just does he's always up there as far as like fullbacks go 0.46 xa per 90 minutes the nearest one to him is actually motwang who is a youngster that's in that position as well who might well be an option for us in the future because he seems to have the same kind of minerals as him but palacio 0.35 jar jar 0.32 they're just never quite on the same level as vida he just does things so as for the starting 11 this year we've generally gone with richard in goal no real surprises there but i feel like he might be a guy that could leave this summer if the bid is right i mean at the moment it sure as shit isn't but there's a chance for it to potentially be right later in the summer with our new goalkeeper joining us who you'll see next season obviously damian tunkara has also been in and around that. I feel like he's kind of maxed out, but he's got really nice attributes. We just really like him. He has had a couple of injuries this year, though. Salem Kadri has featured a lot more this year, and I feel like he is one of those guys for the future. And one of the benefits of this new tactic is because he can play as a CM, he's perfect for that ball in midfield role, should we need him to play in midfield for us, which he has actually done a few times for us this season. I think that he's definitely developing into an excellent player uh, the attributes are definitely creeping in the right direction his determination has interestingly gone down but it seems like positioning is up by five visions up as well jumping reach things like that basically I'm not going to show the progression for each player like i did last time around because there won't be a lot of changes for the guys that i already showed you and vida like when you look at vida's profile he's a good player but he's as good as he's ever going to be he just consistently puts down good numbers he's still got eight assists in the champions league this year it's actually wild how he's managed to do that like and he's not really got that much better since he joined us anyway he's just always kind of been this good there's something about him that just seems to work and i still believe it's the agility and balance palacio on the other hand he's probably getting close to max ca now at 24 and it might behoove me to actually move him over to role training instead of his uh because i don't think we're gonna get much more out of him as you can see he's kind of leveled off a little bit but he's still absolutely ridiculous the key thing is hanging on to him still got four years left though should, should be okay tony sunday as well who's now moved into midfield this year and i feel like he's definitely played better uh, you can see especially in the league matches where he's played in that role but usually in the league matches, he'd still be like struggling to break like 6.8 a lot of the time because when he was that halfback, he'd never get any rating. This year, it's much better. Two goals, three assists. He's just looked way, way better than that. Kamga and Lend as well, like just really solid numbers across the board. He's always just so damn dependable. He really, really is. One of these days, he's going to get outclassed in our team, but I just don't think he's there yet. One player who has burst onto the scene a bit more this year is Jose Padilla. Um, obviously played a lot of non-competitive games for us, but he's got 11 goals this year, three assists. He's a very, very well-rounded player, and it seems like there's more room for him to grow. It's just those physicals that let him down a little bit, but I'm very excited by him. I'll actually show you his attribute progression because I don't know if we did that last time. You can see that there's a lot of stuff going in the right direction for him, and it's exciting, particularly now as he can play in there as well as up front. So he's got more opportunity in the team. Melman is obviously just Melman. He's probably maxed out too. He's unhappy because of... I actually don't know why he's unhappy. Oh, he wants a new contract, which I... He's still got three years left though. And obviously Henry Watara is good, but I still think that new guy that's coming in is going to give him a run for his money very quickly. One last player to highlight would probably be Kwasi Uwa, who has just been 17 goals, eight assists this year. He's played in mostly, yeah, as a striker, often as the Trek, which is why he's got more assists. But the progression is surely going to be starting to look very good on him. Yeah, he's up by five on his anticipation. He's gaining speed. His off the ball is now 18. There's just general good things happening. Let's just see if there's anything from like last season, maybe. So you can see, yeah, since last season as well, just huge gains on the mental side of things. Some nice technicals. His crossing has gone up as well. Even his heading has gone up a little bit too. There's just generally good things happening for Quasi. And he's just played a lot of game time, which is exciting. Wanted to quickly show you the sort of facilities at the club. We are pretty much excellent on everything now. Uh, our facilities and training, as far as I know, are maxed out at 20 now. Everything else, I believe, is also maxed out. So recruitment, junior coaching, all that. You'll notice our stadium has actually been reduced for a little bit because we're at the moment actually expanding it even more to get it close to 10,000 thousand uh, i don't know if that's going to be seated though so it's gone down in cap for a little bit but we'll at least get to stay in our same stadium which is good for gate receipts in europe um i would show you the other clubs facilities changes but there hasn't been any i think the only club in this entire save so far that's improved their facilities was hammering one time the fact is clubs won't start doing that in these types of saves until they start getting a lot of money and the money just isn't there yet not until we start getting to the latter stages where they're regularly getting into europe the tv money in the league has gone through the roof because of the reputation sponsorship all that sort of jazz there's not really been any changes there yet as far as the multinational team goes they actually 
did win their Nations League group, which is not bad with wins against Andorra and draws against uh, Lithuania. And they're not too bad. Uh, their Euro qualifying group is very tough, though. They've already lost 2-0 to Turkey, but it's not the end of the world. Like, they're still definitely improving in the right ways, but it's going to take a bit of time. Right, now to the loan farm, which at the moment is at minus 108, which I believe means we're at 148 players out on loan. And there's like I want to quickly show you in a minute, because something weird has happened a little bit further into the future, which I feel like is worth showing. We've just kind of been doing our thing. You can see now that we've got a lot more players with reasonable potential out on loan over the last couple of seasons, especially in the last couple of years, particularly Hassan al Kamaji, that insane Libyan winger we finally got out on loan to Hamroon, and I think that's going to be a godsend. If we can keep him there for a few years, he could develop in the same way that Jean Dong Suck is now, as he now becomes our only two and a half star player out on loan. 12 goals, 13 assists for Sweetie. He's going to make them into a force if he carries on being this good, basically, and that's exciting. There's generally just lots of good stuff happening. Uh, Mourinho with 24 goals for Slimer as they got promoted. Perez with 20 goals and 19 assists. That's an even better result than last year. What's that? 39 goal contributions for Hamroon is incredible for him, and I'm very excited to see what he can do for them. He's carried them so hard. Conan as well with 19 goals. He may have missed some important ones in Europe, but he's still been fantastic. But I feel like we do need to get a couple more really decent players out to Goodyear. They're just starting to fall off a little bit with some of those loans, but I think there's definitely a time for that to happen, which is why I want to quickly take you slightly to the future to where we actually are on stream, because on the 3rd of July, something very strange happened. And that is that, as always, I offered out every player that we had available for loan, just with a normal loan offer, not even filtering it by Malta. And then for some reason, this happened. Almost every, every single one of these that I highlight in blue that you can see is a loan offer from another Maltese side. I'm, I don't know how many there actually is here. 18. There are 18 loan offers on our players in a single day. And all I did was I offered them out the normal way on the 3rd of July. So I don't know if it's because of the 3rd of July or whether it's just completely random. Needless to say, maybe give that a go because I have no idea what's caused this, but pretty much everyone is wanted by somebody. And look at Zabar as well. They want all of our players. It's incredible. I've never had this many bids on players on the same day before. We didn't do anything different. So financially, we're actually a little bit lower than we have been, but we've been operating around about £39 million, pounds, around about the £40 million pound mark in balance for quite some time. Now, we are apparently failing FFP. I believe that's nonsense, and it's most likely due to the way that FM calculates budget projections. Uh, it basically doesn't take into account the fact that we're probably going to be in the Champions League next year, so it's just discounting any prize money we get from that, which makes sense, but also, you know, a little bit of context, and don't scare me with the big red box. But the aim for Season 13 is to do much better ourselves, which I feel like we're in the right position to do now, as the players are developing. I like this new tactical approach. It's certainly a lot more chaotic, but we just create a lot more... We concede more goals, but we also score more, and we score more than we concede, and that's the key thing, really. And hopefully, we could finally have a year where Goodyear and Hammer, maybe even Zabar, if they take all these loads from us, could get into a group stage for us. If we had three teams next year, it could be a monster year for us, and that's what's so exciting about this save, damn it! So last year, with 14 dilution, we want to make it count. So that's what we're doing over on stream. I apologise if this has been a slightly longer video, but you guys said you wanted to see more stuff around the uh, save, so I'm trying to honour that as best I can without, you know, overdoing things. So, if you have enjoyed, drop a like, that'll be awesome. The Patreon region recap for you guys will be up on the patreon in probably tomorrow and uh, yeah drop a like on the video if you've enjoyed subscribe if you are new got an agent video coming up uh later in the week i think and i'll see you guys very very soon hold your gun capybara bye bye